All right, this, this just might be the, the group, so, oh my gosh. This is so fun. <laughs> oh, your map. <laughs> yeah. Th thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out. And it's so great to see familiar faces. So I think I've, um, I know now everyone here. I'm Paula Francis. I used to live here. Can you um, hear her? Several okay. years ago. And for the last couple of years, I've been living with my sister. Christine down in uh, Massachusetts. We drove up here today, believe it or not, I missed the exit. We were just talking. <laughs> we didn't make it to Canada, that's the good news. <laughs> <so. laughs> what we're gonna do today, um, let me know, just let me know if you can't hear me. I tend to speak softly. But um, we thought it'd be fun to do this sister thing since we've been writing the two of us, her much more than, than me. Um, so what we're gonna do is, after some brief introductions, we're gonna read snippets of our book, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about them in between. Mm -hmm. And we do have quite a bit to share, but um, what at the end we'd love to do is just have a conversation, okay? So we will leave time for that. and. Um, uh, we really want you to get out of this what you came here for. So, uh, you you know me. I'm Paula Francis, and I did a little walk around the country, <laughs> and I ended up writing a story about it, 18 pair of shoes, because that was the question that was most frequently asked, how many shoes have you gone through? Um, so that's my final answer. <laughs> so um, I'll let Chris introduce herself. Paula's sister, younger sister, Christine Noyes, call me Chris. Um, I wrote my memoir about, um, it centered around the day my husband passed away four and a half years ago. And the story skips around a bit. It's, it's, it includes some of our childhood. My childhood as I saw it, mm -hmm. and a little bit after he passed away as well. So it does skip around a little bit, and I'm, I'm probably gonna skip around a little when, I, when we, we read. I've been a chef, a uh, sales representative, entrepreneur, and now I'm a writer and illustrator. And, um, my job seem to find me. I don't go looking for them. So um, I'm going to just start with, I'm going to start at the beginning, the introduction of my book, which is called Close Enough to Perfect. This is my husband, Al. And there we go. A satisfying cocktail. I just want to say publicly thank you for joining us. At the Senior Activity Center. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> no, we just want to publicly say thank, thank you. you. <laughs> this is really wonderful. Yeah, and no, it, really, thank it's you. great to come Provided back to Montpelier yeah. to do this. Yeah, so okay. I really appreciate <laughs> and, and we're very excited that people are here. I mean, it, it's so nice to see people. <laughs> yes. Good. Thank, thank you. Sarah. you. So, a satisfying cocktail, an introduction by Christine Noyes. As a preemptive strike, I realize that Al is holding a bottle of scotch in this book's photo cover. After reading the book, any bourbon purist will feel the need to point that out. When I began to write my memoir, I did not intend to see it published. I wrote to deal with my grief and to keep my husband close. As time passed, I received encouragement from unexpected sources, including one dead for nine years, so I changed my mind. I learned a lot about myself as I wrote the memoir, mostly that my memory fails me as I edge toward the age of 60. You're there now. I'm after that now. <laughs> I search a thesaurus to trigger the word on the tip of my tongue. But in some experiences, I find insight that had eluded me these many years. 
Some insights came from within. Some came from my sister, as we talked about our childhood. I am blessed. I have loved, and I have been loved. And even though the anguish is almost unbearable at times, memories urge their way through the murkiness to make me laugh or smile. I recall a line from the wonderful movie, Steel Magnolias. One of the characters says, laughter through tears is my favorite emotion. I concur that when those two emotional results mix, they create a satisfying cocktail. Drink up. <laughs> Thank you. So I found myself not long after my husband passed away, lying in bed, awake, couldn't sleep, two o'clock in the morning, and all these emotions going through me, and all these words were, uh, almost like the words were circling my head to describe how I was feeling. And I had to do something about that, because if I didn't, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have fallen asleep. So I, I wanted to write them down, and I didn't have a piece of paper, so I picked up my cell phone, and I started typing into my cell phone and putting these words together. And before you know it, before I knew it, I had written a poem. And the poem is actually in the book. I, I finished it, I put my phone down, and I fell asleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I read what I had written, and I really liked it. And I said, you know, this is pretty good. And, um, and I started writing some more, and some more, and some more. I, I um, began with the children's books. I have a series of children's books as well. But the memoir is what I really focused on. And it was a way to get my feelings out on paper. And it, it was very therapeutic for me. And I enjoyed it so much that I've been writing ever since. Yeah, she doesn't stop, believe me. <laughs> it's. Um, it's kind of fun that we ended up together. It was totally unexpected, mm -hmm. um, but life happens that way sometimes. Uh, Chris said she didn't expect to write a memoir. I did not expect to write a memoir. I didn't expect to walk around the country uh, either. Um, but I, I started walking from here down to DC, interviewing people about happiness and what matters in life because I believe what matters in life is what we ought to focus on. Those are the things we ought to measure um, in a gross national happiness kind of measure. So that, that really directs our policy and the po uh, practices that we are a part of. Um, that's another whole story. I'll talk about that at some other time. But as I was reviewing all the data, I was going to write a book about that. What did all of that mean? And I started doing that, but was encouraged by a few people <laughs> who know better than me to expand my book into a memoir. That is totally un uncomfortable for me. She went kicking and screaming I into that. I absolutely did, because um, I'm typically a, a, a much more private person. And some of the things in the book are not that, are, are very, very private. And it took me a while to get used to that. Um, but uh, again, life takes you down a road sometimes that you just never know. And I went with it. So what I'm going to do is start at the end. I'm going to start at the end of my walk um, when I finished in Boston. The Happiness Walker, an introduction by me. People like the thought of me. The Happiness Walker, traveling around the country on foot. With the glimpse at my costume, they see what they want to see. And since this undertaking is less about me and much more about them, I reveal little. They paint in the details to their liking, and the technicolor character they fashion projects much larger than the one inside me. My anonymity somehow invites their favor. Hearts are bared, secrets made visible. I, however, 
remain unexposed in their spotlight, a comfortable way of being. But the curtain is closing, and there's only one curtain call. Mm -hmm. November 2nd, 2019. Mm -hmm. I stroll past Fenway Park, down Commonwealth Ave Mall, and on to Boston Common, America's oldest public park clocking in at 9,861 miles, the completion of my listening project. As with many milestones around this, the country, this one too is anticlimactic. I have a small parade of friends and family who travel far and wide to celebrate the long-awaited moment with me. But the day is awash with gray. I'm not exactly sure what I'm feeling but I brace against it and I posture, smiling and toasting and cajoling, never revealing my tears a knot of joy. I've worn, I've worn this costume so <coughs> long, walking shoes, safety vest, reporter, reporter in my pocket. I'm not sure what I'll find when I peel it <coughs> off. I will no longer be the walker I'll simply be Paula, indistinguishable from every other person navigating the planet, a mother of grown daughters, a divorcee without a home or a job or a car, a woman without her next plan. For someone who's comfortable with the unknown, these details now weigh on me. After all, it's time to digest the enormity of what I've just done and on this afternoon in November, I've just outgrown my tent, which is exactly how I felt. You know, I think anybody that has done a long-term project that they feel is significant and meaningful when it comes to a completion, it's not exactly exciting. It's a little sad, and that's what I was feeling at that time. Um, but the emotion, um, I think the emotions that I, that I carried throughout the walk were like, they ran the gamut. Ebb and tide. <laughs> as, as it is, yeah. Uh, but then it was 2020 when I finished the walk. Uh, in, I'm sorry, I finished in 2019. I still had a few miles to make up to make it 10,000 miles. So what I did is I walked from Massachusetts all the way back up to Vermont. Yes, ending at the Capitol <laughs> with Joe and Christy, actually. Thank you for joining Oh, I was there too. In the rain. <laughs> Chris was my sag wagon from Massachusetts to Vermont at that time as I was walking in silence. And the reason I walked in silence is because, mostly in silence. Mostly. I, I, I failed a few times when I needed a bathroom and whatnot, but I found that in interviewing people, and I did try to interview as many diverse people from all different walks of life as possible, but still there are people whose voices are unheard, people whose voices are silenced, and I really, I wanted to acknowledge that in some way, so I felt this walk in silence was one way of doing that. And luckily, Chris was a, uh, ready to, you know, be my sag wagon along the way. It was 17 degrees that week. She picked the coldest week, <laughs> to, absolutely, to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but you managed somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so um, two memoirs, two sisters, different memories of childhood. Both of us touched upon our childhood in our writing. Um, some of the things we agree happen, some of the things <laughs> we don't agree happen. Anybody who has siblings knows that you can grow up in the same house with the same events and remember them totally differently, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's happened a few times, quite a few times. So why don't you start by reading from... All right, and I said I touched upon events before my husband's death and after. This particular one is about our childhood, my childhood. 
My parents got divorced for the second time when I was 13. At least I understood it that way at the time. Technically, they got divorced only once, but when I was about 10, on the original day the divorce would have been final, they decided to give it another try. I don't remember any of us siblings being happy, excited, or even mildly hopeful about the decision. Many reasons contributed to the collapse of their marriage, not the least of them my mother's mental state. Consequently, I spent most of my days outside away from the turmoil that filled our little house on Jackson Street. I also started to rebel around that time, push the envelope of discipline, and apparently form my views on marriage. My life growing up was like tiptoeing through a densely populated cow pasture, trying to avoid steaming mounds of shit. No matter my diligence, how carefully I chose my path, nor how much I weighed every step, a shrouded, slippery slope always propelled me into a hot, fresh pile of excrement. From the outside, our family looked normal, whatever normal constituted, whatever constituted normal in those days, or today. Two parents and four children living in a small three-bedroom house on a private street. A large yard, perfect for playing kick the can, army, or hide and seek. One of our neighbors owned a pony, macaroni. A small Shetland housed in a corral adjacent to our front lawn. And we sometimes fed him apples from another neighbor's tree. Those neighbors had a huge field behind their house where we played baseball, football, or just horsed around. Normal. It was a much simpler time, some would say, the 1960s and early 1970s. We had stay-at-home moms, dinner at six, and had to go home when the street lights turned on. We went from owning a black and white television to a color TV. Records turned into eight-track tapes, and telephones still had cords. <laughs> when not in school, we spent the entire day outside playing with the other kids from the neighborhood until it was time for dinner, and we were not allowed to be late. We had lunch at the closest house when we got hungry, or sometimes we skipped it all together. Wonderful childhood memories fill my head, proving that the human spirit is indomitable, protective, and to some extent, deceiving. Mm -hmm. Deceiving is the optimum <laughs> word there. I remember, uh, even now, I, I think back on my childhood as being um, Wonderful. It was great. I had a blast. Um, but I seem to have blocked out a lot of the bad stuff. And I, I don't know if that's normal. Some things I had completely forgotten about. But um, as we talk through this book and Paul, as we, we've brought up a lot of this stuff, which is good. I mean, that's why I chose to write about it. It, it again, writing about the death of my husband, writing about a, a tumultuous childhood. It gets things out on paper. It gets them out of very therapeutic to do. And um, yeah, Paula also. Yeah, memories are not precise. They're not, absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah. And we could remember the same instance in totally different ways or at times exactly the same way, which is quite interesting. Yeah, in fact, um, I too, look fondly on my childhood and what I'm going to read won't reflect that probably. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all fodder for what we will grow into as adults and how we choose to live our lives, right. how I, I look at it. So I'm going to read a passage that uh, talks about our childhood as well. Everybody's journey has a beginning. Mine commences decades before the start of the happiness walk. I hit the ground running in the backseat of a 1957 Ford station wagon, wandering around Massachusetts looking for UFOs, my mother's preferred family fast pastime. There were a lot of reported sightings in the early 60s, and my mother wasn't going to miss out should one want to beam her up. Mom was a vibrant, steal the show, let's play a game kind of person. She was not only the life of the party, Joyce 
was the party. And she was the most generous and kind-hearted person I've ever known. Mom suffered from chronic depression, the kind of bankrupt, bankrupted anima that causes one to believe that death is better option than a life. <clears throat> I remember my father waking me and my siblings to take us on a scouting trip to look for my wandering mom one moonless winter evening. Someone found her. Luckily, not us. I wouldn't want that haunting memory. There were plenty of others, believe me. She had plunged into the icy waters of Lake Quinsigamon in Worcester, Massachusetts, not far from where we lived. Though an excellent swimmer, she did not swim. That night led to yet another lengthy hospitalization, a time when therapy equals fistfuls of Valium, incessant electric shock treatments, and bars on institutional windows. My mom had her own army of saboteurs, and they weren't as play playful as mine. Tumultuous. <laughs> <laughs> you teary? I am. <laughs> Yeah, I just so love the way you write. That, that was a background to our upbringing, but as we said, that's not necessarily the whole story, right? Um, I, my mom was very, she filled up. She, oh. If she was here, she'd be up here. <laughs> and we'd be playing charades or something. And singing. And singing. Or dancing. Yeah. <laughs> which we did um, at her funeral. Oh. So the mm -hmm. reason I, one of the reasons I write about her in the book, she was a big part of my life, <coughs> obviously, but um, at her funeral, we had our ashes down on the grave and our immediate family made a circle and we're telling stories about mom and boom, along comes a dragonfly. Mm -hmm sat right down on the ashes. We talked and sang, probably danced. And we weren't quiet. <laughs> for a long time. I mean, it could have been up to an hour. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, that was, that was it. And when we were finally done and we got quiet, off went the oh. dragonfly. It stayed there the whole time. So it of was course, <laughs> a dragonfly represents mom for me, right? Um, and dragonflies present themselves a lot to me and to you. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but on the walk, there were dragonflies every state, almost every town, not every town, but they just came out of nowhere <coughs> and sometimes just went like right in front of me, down the road, having me follow her showing me the way. I, I know, it was it? Because she would have loved to have. She really would have loved to yeah. be part of, of the walk. I know yeah. she would. Um, I and was. I met a lot of wonderful people. I stayed in a lot of um, homes of uh, people that I met for the first time. Some, some I had known, most of them not. Um, friends of friends or family of friends. And she just would have, she would have just enjoyed. Absolutely, that absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so now, <laughs> this, I get to the harder part. Um, again, I said, I, I mentioned about uh, the day my husband died. And the next little piece, I'm, I'm just gonna keep it short because sometimes it, it gets a little tough to read it. But um, we were, we had to get up at two o'clock in the morning to catch a flight, the first flight of the day from Bradley to go to Las Vegas. It was a half business, half vacation. The week before we had been at, um, in Indianapolis, I had gotten sick, we were, it was a business trip. I had gotten sick, we came home. Al got sick, he caught my cold. He went to the doctors, everything was fine. He just had a cold, it wasn't the flu, not a problem. He was having difficulty breathing that morning when we were, because of the cold, he was congested. So anyway, we, we hopped on the plane and the trip just didn't go as planned. And we're well into the situation at hand. 
Okay, give me a second. <laughs> uh, a man appeared in the galley with me and was soon on the floor opening a black case. He clearly wasn't one of the airline employees, so he must have been a passenger, a doctor, I thought. He removed items from the case in the dark galley, and I thought he needed some light. He could do this quicker if he had more light, I thought. I looked above me and saw dozens of buttons and switches, but I didn't touch any of them. I kept thinking, if this man could just have some more light, everything would be all right. I tried to explain to the flight attendant, but my words emerged almost silent, as if someone had turned the volume down on my vocal cords. I asked her three times if one of the switches would provide light before she finally heard me. My volume still choked. She flipped one of the switches to illuminate the galley, and I felt a sense of relief. Everything will be all right now, I thought. The man retrieved two paddles from his case. I knew what would happen next. So. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that was harder than I thought. Um, obviously a very intense moment there. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to describe in words how you feel at a time like that. Um, it was almost as very ethereal, very surreal, as if I was uh, somebody else just watching this from, from down above or something. But it was very real because I was shaking. And there was a whole, the, my husband was, you know, they were working on my husband to try and save his life in front of a full airplane full of strangers um, who were fabulous, by the way. Um, but it was uh, very difficult, and um, I think you captured that really well. In, in, I mean, the intense emotion in in that passage. Yeah. But the, in the the other thing that I like about what you do in the book is it's not chronological, right? Right. And actually, both of us write that way. I don't know why we hop around. Um, but I you, couldn't have put all that in one spot. No, that would have been would've too been much. A, a real downer, <laughs> like what you just. <laughs> but, but throughout, you get you do flashbacks where you really get to know Al, and I wish you got to know Al uh. <laughs> because he was a man worth knowing. Um, big, big, big bear hugs. You know, he'd, he'd grab you and lift you up off your your feet and. His Crack laugh. your back. <laughs> His laugh. He had the great yeah. barrel-chested laugh. Yeah. 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 So I think what happens is you really get to love this man and get to know him really well. Um, so so you, you become part of that story. Right. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Which is kind of what um, I hope to do, too, is to kind of bring you into the story. And I really wish that instead you could have just joined me on the walk. Christy did. Christy walked, what, 100 miles or so mm -hmm. with me? We walked together from Savannah, Georgia, to Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh, I love Savannah. <laughs> and, and Joe, you did some walking with me, too. I walked with you. Um, Five miles before you even started. Yes, right. <laughs> no, 15. 15 miles to Waterbury. Yeah. And oh. fell mm -hmm. in the middle of this. <laughs> uh, but you hadn't practiced walking, and you were about to go on this big walk, and she didn't even practice. No, that was my practice. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how she does everything, by the way. I'm just going to do this. <laughs> just jump, I'm just going to walk around the country. Right in it. <laughs> but if. Um, so because I couldn't bring everybody with me, because, I, you know, I, it's just not possible. I didn't know I was going to do this. But the, the experiences that I had are really hard to convey. First of all, it's not a typical thing for a person to do. Um, and secondly, the experiences at three miles an hour were just uh, very every every minute of every mile was just 
intense because mm -hmm. I had to be present <laughs> if there was traffic, but I also knew I wanted to be present because I wanted to experience every single moment of the walk. So I'm going to just give you a, a little bit. Like I said, I was, I was interviewing people along the way, what matters most in life, trying to collect data, but there's a large swaths of nothing <laughs> in between towns. So I spent a lot of time by myself, not seeing a car or a person this way or that way for miles and miles and miles. And that's where I'm going to take you right now. So. The story has more to do with animals than with people. May 16th, 2016, Ramon, New Mexico. In the silent, desolate corridors connecting cities to hamlets, to farms, to forests, my three mile per hour pace, my three mile per hour pace brings me to a lonely desert byway towards the turquoise trail in New Mexico. I'm alone, but for the antelope and the cattle that dot the landscape. An occasional jackrabbit skirts through the walking stick cacti, and prairie dogs leap to attention to warn their coterie of my approach. Everything out here pokes, bites, or stings. Roadsides forewarn of rattlesnakes, so I flinch with every rustle of every rustle of the low brown grass. I'm wary to of venturing off the quiet road to relieve myself, so I mark the pavement along my way as a dog marks its territory. <laughs> and because rattlers avoid the full heat of the sun, they are less wor worrisome when I stick to the asphalt during the day. But I'm on high alert, er, alert during dusk, and I am right to do so. Though they are as reserved as I when they do appear, I godly abdicate my ground and veer around them. My quietude eventually invites the companionship of a mountain lion. I catch her movement to my left, and I dare not change my stride. I reduce my motion to what is essential. We timidly measure our footing one with the other. Her tracks parallel my trail. We steal benign glances, unnoticing. My heartbeat remains as constant as my gait, my feet barely touching the ground. Grace expands each fractal of space. And I softly whisper, hello, beautiful. Ears perk, and I give more. Thank you for walking with me. We respectfully acknowledge the convergence of our travels, my two-legged and her four-legged passage on Earth. We saunter in tandem until her curiosity is satisfied. I'm sad to see her shift towards the horizon. And she never looks back to say goodbye. I'm overcome with awe spellbound, shivers surface on my arms underneath my all-season jacket. And it's only after I am left alone that I dare stop, and I wrap my arms and hug the moment into my memory, mm -hmm. never to forget. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> I would have loved to have been there for that. Yeah, I wish you were there. Yeah, I, I could have used the ride. <laughs> <laughs> In the bathroom, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> But that, that's kind of how it was um, for people uh, along the walk, too. You know, the mountain lion came, I had this wonderful moment, and then it left. People would come into my life daily, and then I'd leave. But it's, it's been really wonderful, actually. Um, having these connections along the way. And I find that I'm still in communication with many, many people that I've met through email or whatever. And some of them I, I barely even spoke to along the way. But somehow that intense connection remains. 
That's wonderful. And she used to wonder why we left at home worried about her on the road mm -hmm. and she's out there walking along with mountain lions. <laughs> Every time she came home, I would try and give her some mace or something just to make sure she was safe. And she, she oh, everything's fine. Every, people are so nice. And, and I get that, and thank, I thank every one of them. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I still have a whole storage unit of mace. Mace. <laughs> if, if ever you all need one, I've got it. <laughs> But imagine, I can just feel that, that being able to walk beside something that, wow, yeah. that but, cool, um, that would have been neat. It was dogs that were the problem. Domesticated beyond dogs? Beyond anything or, uh, else. Yeah. People were wonderful. Um, but uh, I, I find that if fear became something that I had to quickly let go of, mm -hmm. because I found it didn't serve me at all. And once I have, it's what I brought to the moment, I felt. And I still believe this. It's what you bring to the moment is what you get. Um, and it opens up all kinds of communication, even with the animals, that you couldn't otherwise hope for. Well, we're taught to fear certain things, too, right? Yes. And, and I, th I think it does, it certainly um, says a lot about you that you, you were able to Put that aside and do something this I, I almost said crazy but <laughs> momentous how's that momentous that's better that's thank it, you. That's, yeah. so, it's practice 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 right it's, that's what it is in fact i just want to point out that i do have a, a book of uh oh my gosh what a beautiful country yeah. beautiful country and i have a book of pictures here that i took from just my phone but there's also a little book of uh, some of the people that I interviewed along the way, just to give you a sense of uh, the diversity of folks that I interviewed. But I only have one more to, to yeah, to I have one end, more to read. And we promise then we'll just make it a conversation. Yeah, um, this is very quick, and it's the aftermath. Um, I'm not even sure how long after Al had passed away. Um, Probably okay. about a year. Yeah, I think it, it was about a year, maybe a little less. I never know what sight, sound, or smell will trigger my emotions. Grief mostly hits me without warning, like the pop of a water bottle, as if to remind me that things can change in an instant. Not long after Al died, I drove his Dodge Journey along a back road in our hometown when I heard the familiar pop the sound you get when you stick the tip of your index finger inside your mouth and pluck the cheek. I instantly began to cry and laugh at the same time. Al kept a partially full plastic water bottle in the passenger seat cup holder. In colder months, the bottle collapsed. With the car heat on, the bottle warmed up to expand the plastic, causing it to make that popping sound. After the sound had startled me several times, I asked Al why he didn't throw the plastic bottle away. He explained that he had become accustomed to using it as a time reference when he drove to work, since it popped at almost the same spot in his travel every day. He found it somehow reassuring. And then so did I. The bottle remained a comfort to me, a welcome companion in my routine days, until its untimely demise, an accidental victim of the Massachusetts recycling laws. <laughs> Would you care to guess who was doing such a nice thing that they cleaned out my car and threw away my water bottle? <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea. I never would have done that. In her defense, she did not know, but it was a kind of a quirky thing. Oh and gosh, I felt so bad. I, I know, but, but I, no. It, Things change. Things nothing, have to, nothing, you know, is nothing stays absolutely. the same. And, he, mm. and it, he sends you signs in other ways now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not as much as I'd like, but yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I'd like to see, I'd like to hear from him every day, but. Yeah. All right, and I will too. Um, like I said, I'm, I didn't write in a chronological way, and I'm 
guess I'm not going to be talking about my book in a order either, because I'm going back to the beginning. In all, during my calculated 21,504 hours on the road, an estimated 23,569,000 steps it took, people routinely treated me with kindness and generosity. Countless strangers offered meals, housing, rides, and emotional support. I mentioned some 200 representative people in the following pages. Even as I experienced its wonderment, and even as each rising sun brought a new sense of aliveness, I would never suggest that any part of the walk was easy. Each leg took long and careful planning. Each day required pluck and grit. And each hour stretched my body, mind, and spirit to their limits. My feet calloused, my shoulders and back ached, my skin burned, and my insides thirsted much of the time. It was not easy, but it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. The hardships are not what linger. In actuality, in an odd and somewhat cleansing way, I welcomed them. They chipped away false reflections of myself to lay bare what I needed to discover in order to live life more honestly and fully. And the chiseling is not complete. Each cut seems to reveal a deeper lesson. I remain a work in progress that shifts with each fresh understanding and every new insight. To paraphrase Yogi Berra, I'm taking it all with a grin of salt because the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> and, and I was talking to Chris about this on the way up. I was thinking how I, yes, the walk was hard. It wasn't easy. But when I reflect on it, it's the beautiful moments that I remember and the really wonderful feelings of unity around this country. I know you don't hear that, but that's what I witnessed. Um, and that's what kind of remains for me. Pretty much the same thing we've done about our childhood. We choose, right. we choose to remember all those good things that happen and the bad things, yes, they happen and they're there and we, we talk about them, but we're not gonna let that somehow we've managed to just let that be what it is and focus on, on all the good stuff. And use it. Use it as material for turning ourselves into what we want to be. Right. You know, to, to grow and learn from it. Resilience is, I think, that's the word. It's actually in my subtitle. Um, and it comes up a lot when I, when I talk about my story. Um, and not just for me, but for everybody. I mean, we all, we, 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 we're all resilient. We've all got things going on, and we are resilient people. That's uh, it's what we do. Yeah. Mm. It's what I found out as well. <laughs> yeah. So you can open it up for questions or so comments. Curious, right? so you start with the idea you're going to be talking to people that you go along, asking about what? and happy. How do you make the decision to talk to you first? Or as you're walking along, who are you going to stop and see? Yeah. It was a balancing act between needing to make miles and wanting and have the purpose of the walk being to talk to people. So I always had to kind of make a judgment uh, regarding time. Um, but time also, like a memory, is very malleable too. So um, I, I mostly just would interview people that I met in, who were in front of me. So if I was in a laundromat, I would ask people that were doing the laundry. If I was in a restaurant, I'd talk to people there. If I was walking down the road, people would often just stop and say, hey, what are you doing? Do you need a ride? And 
There's a recorder. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, very few people that I approached or approached me um, didn't want to be interviewed. Less than this many, probably, that I can remember. The interesting thing is all, all this stuff she was doing, I knew cerebrally, I'm sitting back home, and I knew, okay, she'd get up, put on her backpack, and walk 26 miles or whatever. But until you actually see what she went through, my sister-in-law and I took a ride out to meet Paula in Iowa. And we were going to stay for a week and help her along, um, which was great. It was a lot of fun. But it was amazing to actually watch her. She'd get up in the morning, get her pack ready, w water, water. Get, we went, uh, one, one typical morning, we went, she did all that. We went to a cafe for breakfast. While we were, my sister-in-law and I were eating, she was interviewing the owner, right? And then she'd take a few bites of toast or whatever. And then there was a newspaper man that wanted to interview her. So she sat down, oh, there was another customer. She interviewed two or three people <laughs> before breakfast, then ate a little breakfast, and then did a, a um, talked with the newspaper person. And then, oh, by the way, walked 26 <laughs> miles in the July heat through the cornfields and we hopped in our car and went and did some fun stuff and you know and then found the field of dreams found the field of dreams oh. right we did go back there but then we picked her up at the end of her walk and we went to a hotel and she said that was an easy day oh because she didn't have to carry her backpack with her that day because we had her pack and I'm thinking, if that's an easy day, you know, you can have it. <laughs> you know, I'll stay here in the nice air-conditioned car. But until you actually see what she, what she did. And how many interviews did you average per day? I averaged about five per day. Wow. That, was, that was kind of what I was shooting for. Yeah. Always going like new highways, small roads, never walking along the interstate or anything. Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, every kind of road, and then every once in a while I'd treat myself to a trail, which was also very oh. nice because you meet people on trails too, right? right? Um, some places around this country you can't avoid a highway. Mm -hmm. I met a lot of nice police officers <laughs> that way <laughs> and interviewed them through the bars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got <laughs> no, 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 no. They were really wonderful telling me how I shouldn't be walking the highway. Yeah. And they would gladly bring me down right. the road. But I'd always find myself back to the point where I always connected every, almost always, unless it, I never, absolutely never couldn't. Never gaps happen. Never. I tell you how insistent I was on that. There, remember the mudslide on Route one, um, 101, this one? Route 1 on, in California? In California yeah. The mudslide. Yeah, mud so you were walking in Beak Sur. Yeah. I was, so that had just happened, and I had planned to be walking that road. So I walked all the way up to where the mudslide <laughs> happened, and then I got a ride around, and I started walking on the northern side. Right. Uh, I just went back this spring. Wow to walk that yeah, piece yeah. of <laughs> road that I had to miss. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not always a fun thing to watch me do, is to have to be that um, <laughs> insistent. So, um, Paula, you indicated that you, you used a recording device when yes. you interviewed people, and then, I mean, can only do that for so long and it's filled up or, or, or I mean did you then transfer the information uh, to, to yes to a laptop or something or yes I mean, so sometimes I would uh, I would stay in people's homes because that would give me more opportunity to have deeper conversations yes. yep I stayed with Cindy's sister down in Virginia <laughs> oh yeah it was um, so sometimes I would take opportunities like that or in libraries and download and then put it on a thumb drive or something. Mm -hmm. But I also did this in pieces. I, I will tell you, I did this over the course of seven years. I didn't just right. continuously walk like that. 
So I had opportunities to come home, get you know, my technology yeah. in place, and then get ready for the next. Uh, and did you have a, I heard you say that you were the sag wagon for her. A couple of times. Yeah. From Massachusetts into Vermont. Right. What about the rest of the world? Did you have a sag wagon? No, she had a backpack with a tent. With a tent? Yes, so there were points in the walk. Um, when Christy and I were walking, I didn't have a tent at that point. So we would have, we would find hosts. And sometimes I'm thinking, one of the hosts we found, you had a sore something, a sore yeah, like yeah. a, She's and a I went to the, I went to the she, she goes to the oh. clinic, and then this, the doctor that treats her ends up offering to host us, <laughs> you know. So that's kind of how things worked. Things were very, very serendipitous along the way. Often, I'm a planner, so I plan, 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 and then let happen what happens, right? Um, and, but then as I got further in the walk and I realized there will be these long stretches where that's just not going to be probable. Um, I did carry a, a tent, and I was able to be more loose with my schedule. Are, are you looking to use this room? Yeah, yeah. this is the next presentation, oh. so you guys have up until two. Don't okay, all right, so we have a few more minutes. Question. Would you characterize yourself as an extrovert or an introvert somewhere in the middle? You tell me. So, I I, 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 um, I loved being in conversation with people. I mean, one on one or small groups, having meaningful conversation. I'm not much of a um, chit chatter. You know, I just, I just don't like. What, what's that word I'm looking small for? Talk, small, yeah. I don't like small talk. I'm, I'm not good at that. I feel uncomfortable with that. But talk about something meaningful, and I'm fully there. She definitely doesn't want to talk about herself. Right. Yeah. right. So but, I, but then, let me just say this. Then I have these long stretches to walk after yeah. that, and I love that. <laughs> so that I guess that recharged me. So I think that makes yeah. me an introvert. I, I would say knowing you, but just my own observations and experience with you, that you're more private and, and introverted uh, in that um, like you don't exhibit extrovert like me, <laughs> just being out there. Um, so I find it amazing that you could stay present, uh, forget about the walking, with people and engage them and really enjoy them. That's a lot of energy. Yeah. The walking is energy, but to me, that would be I, it's something that, I, as, even as an extrovert, I don't think I could do. Yeah. Well, it's a great point. I'll tell you why that is so. Um, and I'm going to be doing a presentation, I guess now at the library on the 21st of September, that will talk more about the walk, right? So less about the book. Um, in the data and what I found. But one of the things we know about happiness is paying attention to the things that are meaningful in your life. And it's very meaningful for me to have these, to, to kind of tease out from people what is important so that we can really create communities that serve all of us, not just a few, but everybody. That, it, that to me has always been my passion in my professional life. It's been what I do in my uh, volunteer work. So I think that, that made me happy to be engaged in something that I, I felt was important, whether it goes anywhere, you know. Uh, can I, you talk a little oh, bit about uh, what you're doing now? Actually, can I just jump in here? I'm just being a housekeeper here. I think if you move your presentation table in there, then we could, and then they can. Okay. Do you, we have till two, or, we have or are we? like five minutes. Yeah, okay. Oh, but we'll do that. We'll, and Chris and I will hang around a little bit. Oh, yeah, bit. we're not, we're not um, in a hurry. We're not so. going to run right off. So we do have books for sale if you're interested and some things for you to look at. But, um, I'm interested in what you have. Yeah. What was your question? I was 
asking you to talk about what you're doing now. Um, I mean, just, just yeah. Uh, again, that's kind of like planning. An She's planning. <laughs> it's what um, she does. She plans. Yeah, fine. yeah. yeah, yeah. Just so you know, so uh, Cindy had a, uh, an RV and she yeah. toured the the country that way. I bought a um, a little camper, oh. and I really loved the nomadic life. I thought as I was walking around, I would find that one or two places that I would really love to uh -huh. land. I got to say, coming back to Vermont <laughs> is very heartwarming. You know, I, I really yeah. love this place. But if there, if I had found that place, I think I would have been there <laughs> by now. But um, my hope is to kind of continue that nomadic life nice. for a while um, now that I've got everything I need to, yeah. to go forward. I she has. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm not going to spend another winter in the snow. <laughs> I know that. She already has gone cross country and back in her, with her little trailer already. Oh, cool. So, yeah. yeah. And the plans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you her, her safe base that she comes back? To? That's right. That's, I've got my house right. there. Or, right, and that's all I do. Yeah. I sit, if I'm not sitting at my computer, I'm cooking. I do those two uh -huh. things, and that's it. You know? yeah. Although I do have a place down in Georgia now. I bought a, a camper down there. So Paula comes down and stays, brings her little camper down there. And we winter down there now. So, um, yeah. yeah. I, I guess we yeah. become tied at the hip a little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little we bit. go away and then we come back, <laughs> but you know, yeah. So as one last thing I guess we'll leave you with is that um, living together, again, was nothing that was planned. It kind of happened. It certainly is very supportive of my needs. Um, but I've really enjoyed getting to know Chris in a much different way right. as adult sisters. Um, and I think that in our lives, we kind of mm -hmm. carry two different, we, we, were, we were not all that much alike in our belief systems um, when we first came together. No, quite different, actually. <laughs> quite different. But then I think the idea of listening to one another, as I had a lot of practice on the road, um, of being more curious about why people think the way that they do as opposed to wanting others to understand you. Mm -hmm. I think we've had some amazing conversations. Some great, some heated conversations too, but. but Definitely heated. But <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. Because we start here and we do this, <laughs> but then we always end up back here again. Yeah. Always. And it's kind of amazing. We could just, we, we, we find our way to the same spot in a different path, I guess, yes, right. which yeah. is kind of what we're doing and with we our find, lives. And we find we're not that different after all. Right. And that's actually um, what I hope, if you read my book, is what you'll walk away with, is we're really not all that different. We're much more alike than we're not. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming. It was so nice to see all of you. <laughs> Really appreciate it. And thank you to the Senior Center yes. for having us. Appreciate it.